Uh, kia ora whanau. Uh, my name's Mark Simons, and you're probably wondering why I'm standing up here. Um, I have the fantastic opportunity today to interview Mike McRoberts, our MC. Uh, it's a great opportunity because why else would we, you know, we, we're getting this fantastic media personality uh, to Ototahi, his hometown, uh, to present at the Cape Conference. Um, and we'd like to do a little bit more than just having him come up and stand up and introduce speakers and tell us where the toilets are. So I think uh, Mike's got such a fantastic uh, story to tell um, that I'd uh, like to um, have a conversation uh, with him. Uh, why am I being afforded this opportunity? Uh, good question. Um, but uh, I work at Ada Institute of Canterbury, uh, managing our youth and community development team. Uh, prior to that, I did work in media for a number of years. Um, in commercial radio for stations such as More FM and, and The Breeze. And I'm also a, a graduate of the New Zealand Broadcasting School at Ara Institute of Canterbury, Te Pukenga, uh, of which Mike is also an alumni, so there's a little bit of a connection there. Um, a lot of people today uh, and uh, over the last day or two have said to me, uh, oh, it's fascinating that uh, Mike McRoberts is interviewing you. Um, <laughs> And so I'd just like to apologize, and you're more than welcome to leave. Um, you came here thinking that Mike was interviewing me. Um, it's actually the other way around. So uh, I'd like to introduce to the stage uh, the uh, 6 p.m. staple, uh, vegan extraordinaire, the uh, silver fox, the selfie king, because clearly... Uh, there's been a lot of selfies taken with Mike uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, Mike McRoberts, everybody. Kia ora, Mark. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> Very good. We, did, we didn't plan any of this, so um, let's hope it goes well. Um, now, this it feels very like some sort of American chat show, doesn't it? You it know, does. Like, is my yes. mum going to wander on shortly with some baby photos, or this yes. is your life kind of material? Yeah, tell us about your latest production or something <laughs> like that. Um, look, I've got a... This is a little bit weird as well. Um, I stole this from my mum's Tupperware cabinet. Uh, it's got a few little uh, questions and statements in it, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but I wanted to start off with uh, probably the obvious question, and I mentioned, obviously, that... Um, you did study uh, journalism at, uh, at the New Zealand Broadcasting School at Christchurch Polytech. Um, tell us about your career. How, how did you decide to uh, make that choice and, and, and how did that lead to where you are now? Sure. Well, I, I actually um, mentioned yesterday, I think, that uh, I originally was going to go and do law. Um, I'd won a scholarship to study law in my final year at Hillmorton High. And then uh, a guidance counsellor said there was a, um, a hui being run through Māori Affairs looking at journalism, and she knew that I loved writing and, um, and telling stories, and so I went along, and it was actually the radio part of it which hooked me in. I um, arrived at RNZ at about 11.30 as I was getting ready for the midday news, and it, it, it bit me. I loved it. I loved the uh, adrenaline, I loved the excitement, I loved the stories that were being told um, back then, and this is 1983, um, you know, the, the newsroom was filled with s cigarette smoke, um, manual typewriters, so noisy, uh, but just a great energy. And that's what I decided I wanted to do. Um, so I turned down the scholarship and I applied for a cadetship with Radio New Zealand. And the next year I, um, I, I, I got a cadetship. In fact, Simon Barnard and myself were the last two taken on. So I went straight from school into radio, went up to Wellington, worked a broadcasting house uh, up there for a year, and that sent, sent me back to to Christchurch. And a cadetship meant you did everything, from writing commercials to, I was the internal mail boy um, <laughs> at broadcasting house for a, a while. And, uh, but I really, really wanted to do um, newsroom stuff, and I was doing a bit of st sports work in the weekend, that kind of thing. Um, eventually, there were a few others within Radio New Zealand and also um, TRN, the, the um, commercial or the private radio network, who wanted to go into journalism. And it was just at that stage, that pivotal point, where you really had to have training. You couldn't just, you know, you couldn't just write stories. You had to learn about things like defamation and how to report in court and all of those sorts of things. And so they created what is now the, the degree, um, the Broadcasting Journalism degree at, uh, at Christchurch. 
And so we were the very first ones. There were seven of us uh, who went on that course. We got a diploma at the end of it. It was only six months, which was pretty standard for, for journalism back then. I think Barry Guy, who still does sport with Radio New Zealand, um, uh, is the only one or the only other one of the seven of us who, um, who is stu- still operating. I think the rest are still alive. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. You're making yourself sound <laughs> a little bit old, Mike. <laughs> um, so it was a very pivotal point for me. It meant I could go and work in the newsroom, which I did, um, and it started a, a, a lengthy career. It'll be you know, coming up to four decades next year. You had uh, a, a fantastically interesting story earlier today about the Kaikoura earthquake and the and borrowing the the people mover and paying him in TAB credit. Um, there's probably a few more stories that we could probably go through, but just to sort of keep ourselves in in time and and uh, as I watch that clock tick down, um, I've, I'll bring out the Tupperware container and ask you to pull out one of these and it's a, just read out what it says on it, and then we can go from there, I guess. Kia ora, good evening. Okay, so um, <laughs> we'll so that's on, about we'll the put it in the ground. So that yeah, that's 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 about the documentary which I did, um, which went to air a couple of months ago. Uh, I'm Marty Nadi Kahununu. I grew up in Christchurch, went to Hawarden High. Um, if you've seen the the documentary, I don't need to explain too much. But um, when I grew up in Christchurch, you know, forty something years ago. Um, I think I was the only Māori, one of, one of maybe two or three Māori in my year at, at, at high school. Uh, There's no uh, chance to learn te reo. You could learn French or German, but not te reo. And if it hadn't have been for the occasional trip back to my uh, father's hometown in Wairo in Hawke's Bay, I could have gone through my whole childhood, adolescence, and even early adulthood having never having heard te reo spoken. And... Um, and back then, you, you didn't need it, you know. And the thing, I, I was Māori, but I, I identified as Māori. That was fine, but I didn't really need to speak to reo. In fact, when I d- did my, my voice audition for Radio New Zealand, the one that I passed at the age of 17, which was unusual back in those days, one of the comments that came back for Mike McRobert, so Māori name, was that I would probably have to work on my Māori. How now, brown cow, <laughs> wasn't it, the- and um, and so I went through my career having not really n- needing it, uh, which was fine in radio. Once I got into tele- television, it was a bit different because then I became a, a, a brown face on TV, and there weren't that many of us. Um, and I remember, you know, Paul Holmes was a great mentor for me. He, he told me to go out and tell Marty stories, be a champion of the underdog. And um, when I went to TV, in 2001, I remember one night, and so I went there as a backup to John Campbell, who was re- reading at that time, and uh, also as a front person and reporter on 60 Minutes. And John was away, I think I'd only been there for a couple of weeks, and I read the news. Harold Ker- uh, um, Hirschfeld, you know, Carol Hirschfeld was um, co hosting with me, and Clint Brown, who was Fiji and Māori, uh, was reading Sport. And here we were, six o'clock. It was nineteen. Uh, sorry, it was two thousand and one. The six o'clock news, major television network in New Zealand. Three brown faces. Uh, and you know, the moment wasn't lost on my um, on my brother who lives here in Christchurch either, because he texted me to say, "What the hell is this? The cut are they?" But I realised after a while that it, it wasn't just good enough to be a brown face and um, there were a few steps along the way that that pushed me into learning te reo and it was hard you know it's traumatic you know it's not an it's not a second language for Māori it's it's our language and something I feel deeply deeply emotional about and that comes across in the documentary which if you haven't seen is still available on three now Um, (laughs) but it was massive for me. I, I, I have to say, in 40 years of telling stories, it's the most vulnerable I've ever been in my life, and yet it's also the thing that's had the, the most impact. Um, it's been been amazing. And next year, I'm going back to school, to uh, Takiura, which is a, a private um, wananga in Auckland. It's highly sought after places on in, in that uh, full immersion te reo class, and I'm going to do it for a year. 
uh, back to school. So um, thank you. Yeah, round of applause <laughs> for that. That's fantastic. <coughs> All right, next one. <coughs> Uh, social media versus mainstream media. Mm. This is a good one, uh, particularly after hearing Chelsea's um, speech, which was, and she's dead right, and it was, it was fantastic to hear so much about storytelling. I passionately believe in storytelling. Um, in fact, I say to anyone who's you know, thinking about going to, to us or, or TVNZ, I, I do a lot of work with the interns that we get, if you want to be on telly, go to one. If you want to tell stories, come to three. <laughs> Which TVNZ hates me saying, but it's true. I mean, we, we put a lot of stock in, in our journalism, and, um, and that'll be the thing that, that takes you further. I don't really, I'm, I'm not bothered about um, whether people tell stories on mainstream or, or, on, or on social media or wherever they, they have a platform, so long as they tell good stories. Um, I guess the, the flip side of that has been. Some of the stuff we've seen uh, with, you know, particularly over the pandemic, um, with, you know, uh, fake news and, you know, what happened with uh, Trump in the 2016 election uh, and, then the, and then the 2020 election. So we've seen all of that. And, and it really has. It's taken away from, from the mana, if you like, of mainstream media, um, which is it's, it's heartbreaking as someone who's, who's devoted uh, my, my life to it. Um, We'll slowly get them back, I guess. Uh, but our, our linear television audience, so that's people who watch it free to wear, is is pretty much thirty five plus anyway. Um, we've finally, you know, we've finally told ourselves that that is the case, which is good. <laughs> that we can start telling stories for us. <laughs> but um, but we have, you know, we, we we're pushing out to digital as well. We've got a huge digital first video you know, campaign going and. And obviously that's going to be the future. It's just that you know that side of the business has never been able to pay for itself. And when you work for a private company, it's not easy. You, you were saying before uh, we had a brief chat and uh, you mentioned that you're, you yourself uh, are not on social media at all anymore. Um, why is that? Um, yeah, look, I, I had a pretty... W when I first started with social media, I remember doing Twitter and I had something like 90,000 followers at one point and I could actually during the bulletin put out a tweet <laughs> and get immediate feedback on what people thought of the show or or people would tweet me saying hey you know what's going on with this story or whatever and I found that really fascinating just to get that instant feedback um, particularly in television which you wouldn't normally have and it was a good way of communicating and it was a good way of um, you know sort of uh, keeping in touch with what was going on um, but I just found increasingly over the last couple of years, it's been, it's been, um, it's been a, a level of access that I didn't need to give away. And um, you know, I've, I've I've got a personality that 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 makes me want to reply to people or you know help them out or whatever. And <laughs> and it's it's it can t take over your life. And and also, I mean, I, I worked out a while ago that. Um, for me, you know, and remember, my you know my face has been on the screen in, the, in our number one show for the last twenty years uh, here in New Zealand. So uh, you can be private, but you never have any anonymity. So no matter where you go, whatever you do, you're always Mike McRoberts or Neil Walker or you know Mike Pero. Mike Pero. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and depending on what time it is, you know, <laughs> what stage of the evening it is, um, but. And 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 I, I decided. Well, okay, that's that's fine. And so that's how I manage it. And part of that management philosophy for me is not being on social media. Right, fascinating answer. All right, next one from the bucket. My mum's going to be very excited that her tupperware was used uh, by Mike McRoberts. So that's very good. A surprising story. Ooh. Uh, okay. Must have one. Yeah, I've been. We were talking before about um, covering conflict and, um, and getting into the natural disasters. This was all something, when I first went to TV3, the, the head of current news and current affairs, Mark Jennings, you know, to lure me from TVNZ to TV3, said he would seriously invest in my career. And uh, within a couple of months, I realized that TV3, that doesn't mean money. 
Um, <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> yes. It's opportunity. And of course, uh, a few months later, 9-11 happened and that, that changed the world and it changed my career forever. I, I ended up covering the so-called war on terror, went to Afghanistan many times, went to Iraq, went to Gaza five times, um, Lebanon, Syria. You know, it, was, uh, it was incredible. Uh, at the time, TVNZ just couldn't match it, um, and and they they probably wondered why they couldn't match it. We were a lot better with our resources, and you know we just we you're a bit more mobile in, in that situation as well. And plus, every trip that I did, I, I ended up you know kind of increasing my um, my experience and expertise, if you like. One surprising thing with that is one of the ways around it was um, I had a fantastic boss who was CEO of TV3 at the time, and on a handshake, I wasn't insured, which is, you know, like you say that to my bosses now who are Discovery, who are Warner Brothers Discovery, and I mean, you can't go into the, you know, you can't go into the uh, cafeteria without being insured these days. It's, and you look at uh, my, my wonderful colleague, Lisette uh, Raymer, who's just come back from the Ukraine. She, and she's done a fantastic job in the Ukraine, but the you know the kind of um, things around uh, the processes around her being able to go into Ukraine compared to me going to Gaza or, or Iraq or whatever are just so far removed and so different. Um, and and that's not to say one way is better than the other. I mean, I was lucky, and I certainly know of many people who who weren't as lucky as me. So um, and you did have that feeling often that it was a, a numbers game. I did get. Um, Probably the the worst place I've ever been to was would be Gaza, uh, while it's being under attack. Um, that was in 2014. Um, the worst dis devastation and and degradation I've ever seen was the Haiti earthquake in 2010. Uh, I was once um, held captive or detained by Hezbollah, um, southern Lebanon, for a few hours, um, which was interesting. You know when you when you could hear this unmanned Israeli drone above us and the last place you want to be when one of those things is above you is uh, sitting around with four or five Hezbollah fighters. Um, in the end, they did let us go. So, But, um, yeah, so it's it's been fascinating. It's been interesting. What what gives you the motivation to continue to go back to those those places, you know, where there is such devastating conflict and, and, and disasters. What What is it within you that, I mean, a, s a significant amount of bravery involved to continue to go back, particularly if you're not insured. Um, I mean, and I'm assuming it's not like you can just ring up 0800 State Insurance and then, <laughs> yeah. oh, look, I'm just going to Gaza next week. Is, can I get, what's the premium on that? Um, but yeah, what's the what's the motivation behind that? Um, I mean, story storytelling? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm certainly no fan of war. It's It's Awful! It's horrific. It debases the human spirit. Um, but in those darkest moments, whether it be conflict or whether it be natural disasters, you come across the incredible light sometimes. And I'm talking about ordinary people who do extraordinary things. And those are the human interests, the really rich human interest stories that I love telling. You know, they're they're amazing. And those are the stories that can change the narrative of what's going on. Um, I mentioned that I've, I've been to Gaza five times. Once, uh, I think it was 2010, when my um, when my kids were 10 and 8. I've got a son, Ben, and a daughter, Maya, so Ben was 10. And it was during the Christmas, our Christmas holidays, and it was kicking off in Gaza, and I thought, shit, I'd better get over there. And uh, and they were old enough then to know what that meant, and that I was you know going to be in some sort of danger. And so I sat the kids down, and I said, look, I'm, I'm going over because if people like me Reporters like me from around the world go over there and start reporting and making people aware of what's going on. It will force both parties to pull back and get a ceasefire and then hopefully the, the loss of you know um, innocent lives. And they both sort of nodded. They're both incredibly grown up with great social uh, consciences anyway. But um, So I get over there and as luck would have it, I'd only been on the ground for a couple of days and uh, and done a couple of reports into the news, and sure enough, there was a ceasefire. So I remember bringing home, as I said, Ben was 10, and got him on the end of the phone. He goes, Dad, Dad, you did it. <laughs> I said, that's right, boy, your old man did it. <laughs> yeah, like the, the Rambo of three news, <laughs> you're just going in there, I'll sort that out. Um. 
that, that sort of shows that a number of situations that you probably never really thought originally when you started your career that you would find yourself in. Absolutely. Um, uh, even even presenting. Uh, when I first started you know, in radio, um, presenting the six o'clock news was the last thing I was thinking about. Um, even when I got into television, it was something that I wasn't thinking about. Uh, I've been lucky enough to being have given those opportunities and um, and enjoyed them. It, it took me a while to get my head around presenting, to be honest, because I, I love reporting so much. I love telling stories. And and then I realized um, as I got on in uh, the presenting world and you know became a mainstay at six o'clock that um, that I'd get more of those big stories when they came along. So so that's worked out quite well. But it always, for me, comes down to, to telling stories. And I think that's what you do, whether it's um, as a reporter or as a, uh, you know, I've, I've got three or four, four or five wonderful friends who are camera operators, the best journalists I know through their eyes and what they film, um, wonderful storytellers, similarly with editors, uh, with producers, you know, um, and, and what, uh, what Chelsea was saying was true. I mean, you can change the world with a, with a story. You can, you can absolutely change the narrative of something and, um, and bring something to life. And um, I, I love that. I mean, that's why I think that this job, there'll always be this job in some shape or form, whatever platform it is. Just coming back to the, to the conflict thing, how, how did covering the Christchurch earthquakes compare to some of the overseas conflicts and disasters that you've covered, oh, that being your it home was, town. it was hard. It was it was really really tough. Um, I'm from Christchurch, so yeah. And part of my way of getting around, you know, going to uh, conflict zones or natural disasters around the world was, you know, um, I'd be back at home, and that was over there, and this is here. Then all of a sudden, you know, we get the the earthquake here in Christchurch, and not just you know in New Zealand, but in my hometown. And so one of the things too is a as a journalist, as a reporter, you're an observer. Uh, but when I came to Christchurch, I was very much a participant. Half of my family I hadn't heard from. I've got a brother who's a sign writer who, um, who was working in the city on the day, uh, <coughs> ran in, you know, and could only work out where he was in the city because of the signs it had, because of so much dust, because of the signs that it um, painted around various shops. Uh, he ended up helping save a woman who had been uh, crushed in a bus, but it had to stand over a couple of people who had died in that, uh, in that bus crush. And I knew that would, you know, he'd be dealing with that for the rest of his life, and, and, um, and he is. And so, yeah, it was, it was massive, and, uh, and I, I felt hugely, uh, and this, the same with the mosque shootings. Um, Oh, you know, I mean, standing out by the, 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 the memorial, the flower memorial, floral memorial, and seeing this community come together and the, the outpouring of love and support, you know, that, that's what tore me up, actually. Um, just, I, I just wasn't ready for that. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it takes, you, takes you out of your comfort zone as a reporter, as an observer, and places you in that situation. And I found it very difficult. You're, you're obviously a very humble chap, but y you, you obviously understand the significance of, of these things. Do you, do you s see that in that moment, or are you in work mode, or how, how do you sort of get through those, those moments when you're there and it's happening to your, your town, yeah. your, your people? It's a bit of both, to be honest. It, it certainly... Um you know, I mean, like in the very the very first earthquake in September, where there weren't any fatalities, thank goodness. I remember covering uh, um, a, a few buildings that had gone down, and I think it was Limwood Village, and my mum lived pretty close to there. And uh, I was down there, and we'd, I was doing some vox pops. That's where you you know you get the microphone, the camera, and you, you're going up and talking to the public. And and this, that's this is the thing about New Zealand. This is you know, you get the craziest vox pops ever in the world. <laughs> Uh, let alone in Christchurch, my hometown, and a few people know me. So, yeah, this guy comes up, and I'm talking to him. I think his name was Adrian or something. I said, oh, wow, you know, this is crazy. And my story that I was putting together, my narrative that I was telling, is that these buildings, these businesses that had been um, broken, uh, they, they weren't just shops. Uh, you, know, they were, you know, they were livelihoods of, of friends, 
you know, not just shopkeepers, but people who lived in that community. And so that was the kind of narrative I was talking about. I already got a couple of vox fops to support that. Then Adrian walks up and he's saying, yeah. And I, I asked him the same thing. I said, you know these people? He said, absolutely. He said, my, my brother-in-law, boy, he, he owned the psychic shop around the corner, the psychic shop. And he said, yeah, didn't see this one coming. <laughs> and, you know, it's just like it sounds like a joke from a comedy routine, doesn't it? But you know, like only in only in New Zealand. I, I know, only in New Zealand. Uh, you, you, you're just just left speechless. But um, of course, he used it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so but but I I, th I think the thing too is you know I I I love New Zealand and I and I love the people in it um, and I love who we are. You know, when I go overseas. Um, and it's you know I'm lucky I've got a brown face that's that's half the battle sometimes you're, you're seen as being less threatening when you go into a lot of these communities but being a Kiwi is massive you know we are we are understated we're um, egalitarian you know we'll, we'll have as long a conversation with the person serving us than the person sitting opposite us all of those things and and we're just we're just nice people um, and it makes a big, big difference when you are going into someone else com else's community wanting to talk to them about this terrible thing that's happened. They open up to you. And the number of stories that I've done over the years that have been followed up by you know, some of the major networks around the world, but, but never quite the same because it, they just don't get that same thing, that same little thing that we managed to get. And I, I, I love that. I suppose in a room full of careers advisors, we, we probably better ask the question, you know, what, what's your advice to young people who, who are considering a career in media, particularly journalism? Um, what, what things will hold them in good stead to go far in the industry? Well, I think, um, I think the, the thing you want to ask them is, is why do they want a job in media? Um, if it's to be famous, then there's probably a lot easier ways to do it. Uh, you know, for a long time, I went through a, um, a, whenever I'd go and speak to um, journalism groups, um, students, they either wanted to be one of two things, either a foreign correspondent or a six o'clock news presenter. I'd done both, so I was quite a good catch. But I had to say to them, look, you know, there's likely no one in this room will have that opportunity. Um, it, there, there are so few chances, or at least there were. These days it's a bit different. You, If you're prepared to do things you know, not with the backing of a network, well then you can go out and make your own film. You know, there's, there's so many things available. But if it is media that they want to do, I'd, I'd encourage them to, to think about stories and storytelling. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the way they, they need to be going. Whether that's in a conventional sense as a reporter or whether it's as a, a, a camera operator or whether it's as a producer or, or whatever, you know, an animator, could be anything. But um, that's what you want to be pushing them towards is storytelling. Uh, you, we talk about uh, the amazing stories that you've covered. Um, and when you when you get to sort of your level, y you kind of have the opportunity to sort of say, "This is the story that I want to cover. I want to go out and do this." When you're a, when you're a new journalist, you often get told by your news chief, "All right, Mike, you're off to go and do this story." What what's probably one of the worst or, or most ridiculous stories that you're asked to cover? You know, like the dog on a skateboard type one. You know, it's at the end of the news. Oh boy. Um or have you just put it out of your memory? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I once got sent to do something on the sewerage ponds here in Christchurch. That wasn't great. Uh, look, um, I've been pretty lucky. This, you know, um, and and you'll always find something. You know, you'll you'll always uh, find a story that uh, out of something, um, out of sewerage even. Uh, yeah, and and the and the trouble is, uh, well, the thing is, back when I started, you know, when I uh, when I started in the Christchurch newsroom for Radio New Zealand, there were fourteen reporters, as well as a chief reporter and an and an editor, and I was I was a kind of add-on, I was an extra, I was a, a trainee. Um, these days, I mean, we would be lucky to have fourteen reporters in our entire Auckland TV3 newsroom. Um, 
you know, the councils are a bit different. They've got, you know, they've got two or three times the number of journalists we have. But, uh, yeah, so so you are more likely to be going out and doing big stories. And that's that's the thing. I've done a lot of trauma work with journalists over the years. And, you know, it's one thing to go to a disaster zone or a, um, or a conflict. It's another thing to turn up at a, um, at a, a motor accident and see someone dead. So, you know, those... Those are the sorts of things that you're, you're constantly working on with younger reporters. Thank you, Mike. Uh, fascinating. I'm sure you'll all agree that uh, really interesting to hear from. Uh, we, I mean, we could go on for for a long time. You've got. You, I'm sure you've got a lot of stories that you could tell. Um, at risk of having a um, a rush on the microphones, uh, if there are any questions, we've got about a minute and a half left. If anyone would like to pop up and uh, ask. Mike, a question? Oh, we must have. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. There are some some good options now out of uh, broadcasting school or AUT. Um, What's happened since uh, since we have opened up with COVID is that a lot of those young reporters who uh, have been busting to, to get overseas and do their OE have gone. So we're, we're, we're definitely looking around. Um, we've got some really good internship um, programs running now. Um, and, and what is great with the likes of the broadcasting um, school here in Christchurch or even with, with AUT is that they're pretty well prepared. They're, they're coming and, um, I mean, they won't be reporting straight away, but they'll be put into roles which, uh, which, which are important and vital. You know, they're, they're not, um, they're not make-up roles. No, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Lizette Raymer before, who's over covering the Ukrainian conflict at the moment, and she is also a, a, a recent graduate of the broadcasting school. So, uh, there is a lot of amazing opportunities, and uh, only after recently graduating, thrown in to an incredible story and something that is uh, remarkably fascinating. One down here and then we must finish. Yeah, um, so this is uh, how do reporters deal with trauma stories that they're covering. So this is something that we, we yeah, there, there, there is. The, we, we've, we've, we've been putting in things in place. Uh, we haven't done something that's a collective as yet. In Australia they do. In most other countries they have a, um, a journalism authority uh, or collective that, that helps with training in that way. We haven't done that yet, so I'm, um, each organisation is normally tasked with doing their own. Um, so people like myself and others who have been in those situations will, will talk to the reporters and the same thing with dealing with hostile environments and that kind of thing, of course, which we had quite a bit of you know, during the pandemic and during the lockdown. So, um, yeah, those things are, are being addressed, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. And also the younger people that are coming through are really good. You know, they're, they're so much more aware of not uh, of what happens if they don't seek help than we were at that same age. <laughs> so that's pleasing. That's good. All right. We must wrap it up there. But uh, thank you very much, Mike. Much appreciated. A round of applause for Mike McRoberts. <laughs>